What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Hi, this is Richard Bradley. I'm the editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and I'm here with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk. We are talking about their new book, Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. Tony and Peter, I wanted to talk about the fact that there's been a continuous battle in the financial services industry between the quote-unquote fiduciary advisors, those who believe you should have to put your client's best interest first, and the brokerage community, those who believe that so long as a product is generally suitable for a client, there's no need for a fiduciary legal standard. So both of you have been proponents of the fiduciary standard, but as I read this chapter, I realized that even the, the uh, fiduciaries have figured out a way to operate in legal gray areas. So this is one episode where I think the listener is going to get an incredible value because they need to know exactly what their own financial advisor is, regardless of whether or not they like him or her personally. Talk a little bit about, if, if, why don't we start with Peter here, because I know you've done a lot of work on this and you write about it in Unshakable. What are the different categories of quote unquote financial advisors and what does it really mean for clients? Can I interject something first? Because I think it's important for people to know that the community as a whole, right? The people that you look to for financial advice you have to start with a presupposition, and that is, do I want somebody that's legally required to put my interests first, or do I want to hope that somebody that I like, who might even be sincere, but they could be sincerely wrong because they're representing a firm who is not putting your interests first and they're not legally required to. That's the difference between a broker with a suitability standard, which is anything that's suitable, versus a fiduciary standard, as we said before, they tell you to buy IBM, you buy it, they buy it later in the day, they legally got to give you the better stock that they bought later on. That's a very different standard. And people have to understand that because of the 310,000 people that are in this financial advising community around the United States, you're talking 90% of them are brokers. They might be called a wealth manager, a wealth advisor, anything of that nature. So really you have to understand only 10% of them are legally required to put you first, to make your interests the number one focus. To me, that seems insane. But even amongst them, there's a differentiation. So let me clarify, and then I'll throw it to Peter, and he'll give you some of the details. There's only three types of advisors. Brokers, that's 90% of that 310,000, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's a group of people called fiduciaries, or independent registered investment advisors, RIAs. They are held to that higher standard. So of the 310,000, there's 31,000. I wrote about that in Money Master the Game. Part of why we became partners is because Peter came along and educated me that what he calls where the dead bodies are. There's this gray area that people are able to go to that even the fiduciaries are able to go to where they're what's called duly registered. It means they're registered as a broker and as a registered investment advisor or fiduciary. So this is the crazy thing. <laughs> They're sitting in front of you wearing a hat that says, I'm an RIA, I'm one of the few who do, that put you first, I'm legally required, I'm not making commissions off of you, I have no conflicts of interest, I'm only giving advice because I really believe it's the best for you, not because I'm getting paid commissions to do that. In the middle of a conversation, they can turn their hat sideways and become a broker. You don't even know they changed hats. They don't have to tell you that. They, they don't have to do tell it. you that because they're just duly registered. And now what they're doing is they're selling you a product that they make a larger commission on. They're selling you a product that isn't necessarily better for you. It's suitable for you. And they're playing the exact same game. When I found this, I went totally berserk. Now, I understand a lot of these RIAs were brokers who wanted to wear the white hat who wanted to leave an industry that's closed and controlled where the house always wins, where the house designs what they're gonna offer you, and they took this risk. And quite frankly, it's hard to make money when you're just getting a flat fee or a small percentage of the assets. And so they try to figure a way to play both places and still try to have integrity. So I'm not attacking them. But morally, you're either for me 100% or not. Switching hats in the middle to me is insane. Maybe you can relate to share with some of the, some of the things they gotta look out for, because yeah, this is right. just crazy. Crazy. This is an extremely complex space. So it's no wonder the average person's confused. First of all, I'd say it's a shame that it happens in the United States because if you look at other countries, the United Kingdom, Australia, 
Every advisor has to be a fiduciary. It's the law. It's, mm-hmm. it's the law. It's reasonable to assume if you go to the financial advisor, they have to put your best interest first. And we get to the United States and you go, well, the United States just lets everybody do whatever they want. Not true. We say doctors have to act in their patient's best interests. Lawyers have a fiduciary obligation. CPAs do. This is unique to financial advisors in the United States. So why? Because the financial uh, lobby, the brokerage houses, formed a lobby that is very active in keeping the fiduciary standard from prevailing. Why? Because they want to sell their own products. They want to charge more for certain things than other things. They don't want to have to in the client's best interest. They want to continue to act in the shareholder's best interest, which means you want to extract as much from the client as possible, which you can't be aligned and be doing that. You can make a reasonable profit, but you can't have the fiduciary standard and be as profitable as you are today. So this is why 90% of people are brokers. And like Tony says, most of these are really good people. They're trying to get a job and brokerage houses will hire you and say, go produce in our model. And then they're successful and it's hard to leave. Now, like Tony said, 10% say, you know what? I'm going to be a fiduciary. I'm going to hold myself to the highest standard under the law. I'm, I don't have to in the United States, but I'm going to opt to be a fiduciary. I'm going to f- be a registered investment advisor or work for one, which means every client I'm with, with I have to act in their best interests. So somebody comes along and goes, you know what? I'm going to do both. Well, guess what? You can do that in the United States. You can be... Now, when you ask them, what are you? Are you a fiduciary? Or, you know, they will always, in their pitch meetings, say... I'm a fiduciary, you know, I'm, and they're telling the truth. They are a fiduciary, mm-hmm. but I have never heard a client tell me, yeah, my former advisor said they're a fiduciary and a broker. And, That's just never and happened. there's no legal requirement for them to tell you that. No, you can go online if you are f- familiar with FINRA's website, the SEC's website, and figure it all out yourself. But, I mean, Tony talked to the 50 of the top financial people in the history of the world and <laughs> didn't know that, you know, after yeah. he came out of his book. And I will tell you, the people I'm in front of that have 100,000 or 100 million, nobody knows this. This is a complicated mess. And it's become further complicated because now brokers have to be fiduciaries in certain instances. And independent advisors, we know some of them are duly registered and they're not fiduciaries. So you you have to get down to a, a, a very small group that's a fiduciary when it comes to investments all the time. So you basically want to say, are you a registered investment advisor? And um, are you also affiliated with a broker dealer? Uh, you want them to be a registered investment advisor who is not affiliated with a broker dealer. Mm-hmm. From there, it even gets messier. You can still have a fiduciary that has their own products. So I can set up my own RIA, and then I can have create my own mutual funds, hedge funds if I want. I can say I'm a fiduciary. I can charge you a fee, and then I go put my funds in your portfolio. And charge you another couple percent. Charge another, right. Which is like going to the Honda dealership and, and paying a fee to ask what car you should buy. Don't be surprised when you get the Honda. Right? So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to be honest. Right now, I'm, I'm feeling a little confused, a little demoralized, a little overwhelmed. Yeah. What's the answer? What's the, what, what are the right questions to ask that will kind of uh, not take you down the road of all the possibilities, but tell you what the right solutions are? Well, for, first of all, just remember, there's only three things. So are they a broker? Are they duly registered or are they completely independent? That's what you got to look for. But maybe you can give them some of the criteria, the well, things to ask for. At first, I say don't be demoralized. I think one of my favorite things Tony says in all contexts, and that's just when it comes to this, is don't do the same thing and expect a different outcome, right? You have the financial advisor you deserve. There are plenty of financial advisors out there that are pure fiduciaries, not just creative planning. Yes, we want. Everybody in America to be a client of great, but we know that's not the, the there's, reality. There's, there's plenty of great there, firms. To be specifically, yeah. there's 5,000 yeah. out of 310,000. Now you know why it's so hard to get there. So it is hard, but there's 5,000 of them in the United States out of the 310,000 that are not duly registered yeah. and that are truly registered investment advisors who are fiduciary only for your benefit. So and, That's right. And everybody listening to this podcast, just spending this 10 or 15 minutes with us, already knows that all they have to do is ask their financial advisor, are you a registered investment advisor? We want the answer to be yes. Mm-hmm. Are you affiliated with a, a broker? You want, you want the answer to be no. You could also ask, do you have the Series 7? You want the answer to that to be no. That's the license for being a broker. And then do you, own any, do you have any proprietary funds or does a sister company affiliated with you have any of your own funds? You want the answer to be no. Which, by the way, just yeah. to clarify, I, I won't say the firm, but there's a particular firm, and I like the people involved very much, the strong fiduciaries, and they lay out the plan for you for you know, your 1% or less, but then they recommend these funds, and these funds are owned by another firm, owned by the same person, right? So, and they don't tell you that. 
It's just like when I found it out, it's just you want to strangle me, going to charge me 2%. I already paid you to tell me what's the best investment. Why would I pay you on top of it and go 2% when it's your fund? That's, that's like it's double dipping once again. And it's they'll even nuts. have a different name. So there's a no different way name. you can yeah. connect the yeah, two. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. And so, I, I, again, the, the folks, they can look, they can easily evaluate their advisor. And like that's the first step. We still want them to have a good investment philosophy yeah. to be used to working with people like you to manage enough money to have some scale and so on. But the bottom line is if you respect everything you've ever earned, right, and you want to do best by your family, you should be asking these questions. Does this person at least have to act in my best interest? And a lot of people, they get to that point, they're ready to make a move, and they say, well, but that person's, you know, I'm clo- that person's a, a friend, or I used to work with them, or the son or parent of a friend or whatever. And I, I express, ex- express to your listeners now what I express to them, which is your first loyalty should be to your family. Right, So if you know that you are better served, and of course everyone's better served when someone has to act in their best interests, uh, do you want your spouse, who might not be as sophisticated as you are, as involved as you are, walking into their office when you're gone, and then you know, winding up with whatever product that maybe you have a guard or awareness about that they don't? So if you've put the family first instead of that relationship, it becomes very easy to follow through on that decision after you get educated. That's right. It makes the choice starker, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. You also just got to think about the fact that that a lot of these firms will hide that they're making commissions by they change the name they they call consulting fees. Mm-hmm. Can you you were the first person to tell me right. about this? So, there are some independent firms because you're not allowed. You know, if you don't have a license, if you're purely independent, uh, like Creative Planning, we don't. No one has the Series Seven. We couldn't collect a commission from a mutual fund company if we wanted to, but we could. Believe it or not, we could go to a mutual fund company and go, "Hey, we'd like some consulting fees." And so instead of revenue sharing for the mutual fund, they give us consulting fees. Now, I don't know what consulting we're doing, right? So you can collect those fees, and it's the same quid quo. It's just a crazy deal. Unfortunately, I mean, this become, this, that, that layer is very, very difficult to get to. At some point, you just need to feel like, you know, once I've checked all those other boxes, that hopefully my advisor is not engaging in those kinds of practices. Another common industry practice is an independent firm can charge somebody 1% and say, hey, we're now going to go to a portfolio manager that charges just 0.25 or just 0.3, but they are that portfolio manager. It's just a different name, right? So I'm charging you 1%, and then I send you down the hall, and then that guy might go buy funds owned by other companies, but we've layered another fee in there. The advisor should just get one fee on your investments. It should be disclosed up front, and it should... It should not change based on any way, shape, or form that I present the investment rights. And you got to remember once again, I got to say it again, you know, you got to pay something for this, right? That's it's right. 1% or less is what you should be paying for everything. And if you're paying that 2% or that 3%, every 1% above that is costing you 10 years of retirement income because of not only does your, you get compounding on your investments, but fees compound. That's what people are missing. And so you hear 1% and you think nothing, or 2% and you think nothing. It could be the difference between financial freedom or financial insecurity. It really can be. So, Peter and Tony, let's say that someone is either on their own uh, or because they've been listening to these podcasts and thinking about their own financial situation. Let's say they're, they're considering making a move to another advisor. Let's say for your guys' benefit, it's going to be a creative planning, which I know you both work at and, and uh, can benefit from. Sure, of course. Um, I talk with a lot of folks uh, who think that they want to make that move but are intimidated by the fact they imagine it's logistically just a paperwork nightmare that it's going to take months and months. Is that true? Or you is it, you should oh, it's remarkably easy. a little bit easier. easier. Years ago when, when Tony moved over to the independent, independent world himself and started this self-discovery, he, you, know, you just bring your most recent statement in, you sign some paperwork, and a week or two later, everything shows up as is. There's also this perception that everything gets sold. You know, I've, I've just had somebody in my office yesterday who said, okay, I've made the decision to come over, but I hate all the taxes I'm going to pay. I said, wait a second, you're not going to pay any taxes because the funds move over as is. So if you bought Microsoft at $5 and it's 10 times higher today, we'll hold that position. And by the way, you'd like an advisor to continue to hold it. You don't want somebody who's going to blow it out and go do, go do something in their specific strategy. You want it customized and tailored to your needs. You don't want to create a lot of damage to hire an advisor. So it's a matter of paperwork. You wait a few weeks, everything shows up as is. If you've got a good advisor, they'll come back to you and say, hey, look, some of these things we're going to hold for tax reasons or because they're perfectly good. And then we'll make these changes over here. And you can put yourself in a better spot you know, very quickly.
You know, there's another question that comes up a lot when, when folks are meeting with potential financial planners. Uh, you hear it, I think, pretty often. What's your philosophy when it comes to investing? You guys think this is a question that, that potential clients should ask? Is that right? Well, everybody is an individual, right? So the beauty of CPI or any great firm of this nature is, I, I was talking to Mary Calhoun Erdos, who's head of JP Morgan. She manages, between her team, she manages 2.3 trillion with a T, right? And one of the great things she said to me is, she, and this is part of what I do as you know, investor psychology, she said, you've got to understand what that individual needs because money isn't just money, it's emotion. And so we got to get you where you need to be financially, but we got to do it in a way that psychologically doesn't produce so much stress that you're not going to fall through or you're going to jump out in the first place. So everything has to be done for an individual. These cookie cutter things that people do where they have three funds and the, the Aspen and the, and the turkey and the whatever fund that they have, right? And they put everybody into it. One size fits all to me is a, and then charging one, two, three percent of that's it's absurd. It's a disservice at the highest level. Uh, Peter's firm sits down with a couple and they walk through the process. You leave with a binder like this with simple tabs. You know who's in charge for you. And once you've laid it together, I mean, how often do you really meet with your, it depends on the individual, it right? It depends but, on what they're, they set the schedule, but a lot of it's very easy to maintain from there on. Yeah. Sometimes it's once or twice or three times in a year you might be visiting with somebody, but you've laid together a plan that really makes sense and it's individualized for you. And I, th I think that's really an important point and it comes back to something we talked about in previous podcasts, which is really what are you aiming for? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's about maximizing the, the growth of your money, but it's also, as you both talk about in the book, it's about what you want out of life. Yeah. It's about leading a healthy, happy, meaningful life and uh, letting your money grow to the point where you can do that. And for everyone, that's going to be different. And I'm so glad you said that because most people, when they're shopping, they don't realize that's what they're looking for. And that really is ultimately what everyone's looking for. When you ask them, well, what do you want the money for? Well, I need this much money per year for 10 years in retirement because I'm going to travel a lot. Then I want to spend less. You want the portfolio pointing to that. You can go to an advisor and find out they're an RIA, they're a fiduciary, they're not duly registered, they fit all of those things, but they're a market timer. Or all yeah. they're focused on is maximum growth. Well, maximum growth, if it can go up 20% in a year, it can go down 20%. That's in a year. That's a rule of investing. And so you really want somebody who's going to say, what are we trying to do for you? For some people, it is maximum growth. They're financially independent and they're giving you, you know, I've got people that have tens of millions of dollars who go, my goal is to double this in a certain period of years. Okay, that's our mission. That's not most people. Most people, I need this much money at this period of my life. And I know I'm going to get some of it from other sources, but I need to get this much from here. Well, how do we make that portfolio have the highest probability of creating that specific outcome? That should be the mission of your advice. With the least amount of risk. Yeah. Right? So you're not going through the volatility. I mean, that's really what this is about. Getting people unshakable is getting them into a place where they have a plan and an advisor that can navigate whatever comes. Where they're prepared, they know that there are going to be corrections, there's going to be bear markets, but we're going to make sure that you maximize lowest, lowest downside possible, most upside possible, but also do it without paying an arm and a leg and giving away a third or 50% or in some cases 70% of your nest egg to somebody that just is frankly just overcharged you. So this is a great conversation for a client to have, an investor to have with a financial planner because it's not just about how much money do you want. It's really about what do you want to do with your life? What are you investing for? And I think, frankly, those are things that, that we're all so busy, we just don't think about enough. Yeah. And I think that's where sitting down with somebody who's qualified knows how to dig in and help you uncover what are your needs really today, tomorrow, in the future? What's going to fulfill you? It's not just like the necessity so I can retire. I mean, most people today, a lot of people don't want to retire. Some of the most successful people in the world that are my clients, they're never going to retire. I'm never going to retire. You know, you look at Warren Buffett's, what, 85 years old right now. Steve Wynn's a dear friend of mine. He's 74. Peter Gober owns the Golden State Warriors, 74 years old. And they're doing more today than any other time. The goal is to have enough money that you don't have to work. And then ironically, you usually work at something you love, even if it's nonprofit. You yeah. do it because it fulfills you, not because you have to. And you walk different. But you'll never get there if you don't know who to trust. You'll never get there if you don't know the hidden fees and the, the half-truths, if you will, that are part of this industry. So you got to get yourself a fiduciary, somebody that is not selling their own funds or somebody else's and getting a compensation or consulting, somebody who truly puts your needs ahead of everybody else's. But I have to add one more piece. Um, there's a cross that you can think of. 
if this is a salesman and we're going across to a fiduciary, a lawyer, a doctor, a true financial fiduciary who has to put your needs ahead, you want to not be on this end, on this end. And if we've got an arrow going up and down and down here is you know somebody that's unsophisticated and up here is somebody who's totally sophisticated, you want to get an RAA who isn't just an RAA and not just somebody who isn't duly registered. You want to get somebody that's sophisticated, that knows what to do, that's been through the bear market successfully. Somebody also, quite frankly, is large enough to be able to have been through the ups and downs and managed it effectively. And so that highly sophisticated total fiduciary, that's your target. And in the book, we give you a series of checklists of exactly what to ask for everybody so you don't have to try and memorize this. And you'll be able to uncover it because yeah. I've had guys look at me straight in the face. Like I actually personally knew and asked me, fiduciary, look me straight in the face as a fiduciary. And then I said to him, do you get commissions? And he says, no, no commissions. I was like, okay, I think, I, but he was getting consulting fees. <laughs> and, like, and who would know to ask that question? Yeah, I didn't know to ask that question. Yeah, right. That's that's Peter's yeah. gift in helping me in this book as our partnership. And we've done everything we can to educate, and so you know it's up to the listener or the reader of the book to just de demand demand it. And there's thou like Tony said, there's thousands of options, but they're cl they're hidden among hundreds of thousands of options. But you can find those people with with, with this information and make a good decision. It's literally five thousand out of three hundred ten thousand, so that's one point six percent of a marketplace, right. which tells you ninety eight percent you want to avoid. Right. But there's that one and a half percent roughly that, that you want to do. And business that one and a half percent, I don't know if it's ninety percent or less, are overseeing thirty million or less. It's a very scattered, so you really get to a very small group of firms with any scale in that space. So we and here you have twenty two billion to give you an idea of growing at creative planning. Yeah. So we've talked about a number of questions that, that investors ought to ask a financial planner. There's one more, I think, that is important, but it, it sounds technical, but it, it's still a, a great question to ask, and that is, where will my money be held? Uh, great question. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Bernie Madoff is why that's that, important. That's a big one. I mean, we're, we're actually here in West Palm, and, and from here I go to Fort Lauderdale to meet somebody who lost $13 million in the Madoff. Oh. Uh, scandal, they had $13 million there. And people often ask me, well, how did that happen? And how would I uncover? And I said, look, this is easy. You don't have to uncover anything. Don't ever give an advisor your money. It's that simple. So people go, but babe, I, don't you want to manage my money? I say, I do, but we don't take custody of the money. And most advisors don't. So when somebody hires creative planning or most independent advisors, you don't ever write a check to creative planning. You write it to a custodian. A custodian, as the people would have heard of, would be like TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Scott Trade. So the money's never coming to creative planning or the advisor, it's going to the custodian. So we would help a client fill out paperwork, moving it from wherever they are, let's say it's Merrill Lynch or another brokerage house, over to that custodian. They have their own online access, they have their own independent statements. They don't have to take our word for it on anything. We don't have ac access to take their money and run off to the Bahamas. It's their money, we just have the authority to place the trades. And so that's the best setup. Now I think Madoff, Madoff was an independent advisor, but he took custody. Yeah, so that's okay. the issue is don't ever let an advisor take it. Some people go, but this person's uh, in my church or religious affiliation or I know them from the, the shared uh, living place. Well, actually the majority of Ponzi schemes like Bernie Madoff are what are called affinity scams, which yeah. they're people preying on their own. So to me, that's so not that's a exactly great, the wrong. That's argument. exactly the wrong argument uh, to be making. And some people say, but oh, that's such a good money manager. You don't need a money manager so badly to give somebody custody of your money. Let's mm -hmm. eliminate that risk. I mean, we've right. touched on in this podcast all three of the C's that, that people are looking for, whether they know it or not. One is no one wants them to steal their money. That's custody. That's that C, right? Don't let anybody have custody of your money. It's that easy. Second, conflict. Well, don't accept it. You don't have to work with an advisor that has a conflict. Don't work with somebody who's a broker or affiliated uh, with a brokerage house who's duly registered or sells their own products. And third is competence. You know, that scale, that chart Tony was, was talking about. Look for a firm that's a little more sophisticated, somebody who's got experience. You don't go get knee surgery from somebody who does one knee surgery a month. You want the guy who's doing it three times a day, every day, right, that knows what he's doing. And so I think if you focus on those three C's, you're, you're in much better shape. So and, and, and advertising doesn't do that. In the world we're in today, people want content so bad that you can work on Bloomberg and have somebody up there give you advice. I saw some things when Money Master Game came out, and one particular man, and I did more than 100 interviews, but one particular man and a buddy of his who are independent advisors, I couldn't believe it. They were attacking Ray Dalio and saying he doesn't know what he's talking about in this book. You know, he's the most successful hedge fund guy in the history of the world. We should Average all not 26 know what we're right? talking about like that. Uh, but but it's sitting there and Bloomberg and this guy's talking about things. And I find out one of the guys managing a hundred million dollars, like you know your savings account for everybody. That's the total amount he's managing. Another guy was managing. Josh was telling me I think it was ten million dollars total. So. 
You do need to make sure it's still somebody that has got the skill set. That's why referral can be so valuable as well. So let's say uh, you're happy with your advisor or you've, you've gotten a new one. There's another part of the process that also seems really important, but it's kind of overlooked. And that's what to look out for when you're looking at your statements, right? Whether they're month, once a month or whether you're looking online. Um, Peter and Tony, can you talk about the things that, that will really be helpful um, to really get the most out of that statement? Well, I mean, one thing is, is kind of hard to figure out is what you really don't want to see on your statement is the, comp the advisor's own funds. And most brokerage houses and even independent advisors, as Tony talked about, they have their own funds, but they have different names. Mm -hmm. And so most statements, you can take that fund name, you can type it into Google, get a ticker symbol, and then you can start to learn about the fees, which we talked about in, in a recent podcast with you. And you can also start to learn who the parent company is. But I would tell you that you, if you're getting to that point, you're doing too much investigating. I think it's always a good place to, to, to go. But the ideal thing is just to find out, does your, does your firm you're working with have any access to proprietary funds? Because what you don't want is the existence of conflict. It doesn't mean if it's manifested itself now. When it's manifested itself, it's too late. I don't want to go to a doctor who gets paid more if I have a certain type of surgery uh, or a certain medicine in his cabinet that, that he owns. And if you buy that medicine, he's going to make more money. I want one that has all of them in his cabinet. So it doesn't really matter to me what I'm taking today. I don't want that conflict existing in our relationship. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I've been talking with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk, the authors of the new book, Unshakable, your financial freedom playbook, creating peace of mind in a world of volatility. Um, this is one in a series of podcasts where we'll be doing some more. Thank you very much for, for talking today. Great to Thank be you. with you again. Thank you. Really appreciate it. appreciate it. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating a Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan, or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio, or again, help you to create a plan. It's completely complimentary completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program. And also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we'd certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, go to unshakable.com. And know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated to Feeding America. 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people this book and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting Feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner. And live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable Podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning. It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International. Copyright 2017.